Hi, I'm Jeremy Begby, Director of Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts, and I want to thank you for tuning in to these conversations we've been recording during periods of lockdown and isolation. I'm fortunate to have been able to share this space with musicians, authors, writers, educators and activists. And I've learned a huge amount about the interface between the arts and questions of race and social justice, as well as about the enormous relevance of the artistic imagination for the church, not least during a global pandemic. Thank you all for watching, for commenting and for sharing your opinions. We hope to have more coming soon from Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts and hope you'll keep in touch with us for more in-person and online events in the future. We wish you safety and health for the coming year. Thank you. Cecilia Gonzalez Andreu is Professor of Theological Studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. With a doctorate in theology and the arts from the Graduate Theological Union Berkeley, she's a leading figure and writer in the field of theological aesthetics and especially well known for her advocacy of Latinx theology. Among her many publications is her book Bridge to Wonder, Art as a Gospel of Beauty, where she argues powerfully that the pursuit of artistic beauty is crucial for bringing communities together and for learning how to celebrate the theological insights of those who are not naturally at home in the world of written texts. Tony Alonso is Assistant Professor of Theology and Culture and Director of Catholic Studies at Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. For many years, he's worked at the intersection of theology and culture with a particular focus on worship and ritual practices. A Grammy-nominated composer of sacred music, as well as a theologian, his recent book, Commodified Communion, offers a theological account of contemporary consumerism and its relationship to the Eucharist. Tony and Cecilia originally met and worked together at Loyola Marymount University, when Cecilia was a brand new faculty member and Tony had begun his graduate studies in Cecilia's department. They'd been friends and collaborators ever since, and it was a pleasure to bring them together for this wide-ranging conversation. Tony and Cecilia, it is an absolute delight to have you. Welcome to Duke to this conversation. And great to meet you both, uh, albeit online. You already know each other quite well. You go back a long way. You are both very well known for integrating theology and the arts in distinctive and very effective ways. Um, have these worlds always linked up for you, or is this a fairly recent pursuit? Uh, Cecilia, perhaps if we start with you. You were born in C Cuba to a highly artistic family uh, and a Catholic family is that as well. How did the arts and theology begin to interweave for you? Well, I, I don't think I really ever have a memory of when they weren't. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I my earliest memories of faith are actually uh, from staring at uh, a mural that, uh, or a fresco that was in my parish church in Havana uh, of um, the of Calvary and 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 of the storm, and and Jesus on the cross, and I was just extraordinarily fascinated uh, by by that uh, image and by everything it made me feel as a child. But my my mother was the choral music director and organist uh, also at the parish. Uh, mm -hmm. She was a classically trained uh, harpist. Um, and, and played with the symphony as well. And so I was, I was inducted into the choir very, very early on, uh, which I loved. And, Love uh, and myself started learning to play the organ, although I, I never got any good at it. Um, and, and my father's a painter. And that's where, where God was. God was in all, all of this intertwined beautiful incense and, and, and music and, and the smells. And, and in a world I, where I lived, where there was little of anything else because we were living under a very repressive regime, that, that space was a, a place of refuge, uh, yeah. which gave sense to, to reality, which was missing otherwise. You said that when, earlier we were talking, you said when you moved to Miami, uh, things were less integrated as far as the arts was con concerned. Is that right? 
Well, yes, I, 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 I mean, that was what I missed the, the most. I, you know, when I arrived in Miami, the Cuban community, you know, we were refugees and actually we were worshiping in what had been a car dealership. That mm -hmm. was that was our makeshift church, yeah. um, and so the the shock <laughs> uh, to my to me of of going from from this extraordinary beautiful uh, space and 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 aesthetically full life uh, in Havana to that was was enormous, um, and so it, it 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 felt like God had left. Um, mm. and, and it was, it, I really, and I, I write about this in, in the, in the opening to my book, didn't really find that integration again until I stepped into Loyola Marymount University as a, a freshman. Um, and Tony knows our Sacred Heart Chapel beautifully, uh, well, and actually features in one of his songs. Um, and he was sitting in, in, in our Sacred Heart Chapel uh, as a freshman that I finally felt I have a home again. My first degree from LMU is from LMU's film school. Uh, it's, right. it's very respected film school. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I was a documentarian. I was, I was making documentaries mm -hmm. and, and uh, espe especially about Latinx uh, communities and about yes. Latinx faith and Catholicism and, and working on many projects, media projects of that type. Um, and I was also uh, going abroad. I, I was doing a documentary uh, series in, in the Holy Land, uh, you know, and I'm a 20 something filmmaker. And I realized I really know my, my craft. I know where to place cameras. I know how to do the lighting. I know all that but I don't really know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> I, I really need a theological education that goes beyond being a cradle Catholic. And, okay. and so I, I went back for a master's in theology and Tony and I both are graduates of LMU's uh, MA program. Uh, and, and I did that as a, as a filmmaker uh, right. to, to be able to just learn okay what am i talking about uh what is the what is this tradition uh that i'm i'm involved in that's lovely um tony a similar background i mean you've you're, you're a musician through and through among many other things has that always been the case yeah we have similar and very different backgrounds uh cecilia and i i actually grew up in southern minnesota um, my father moved uh, with his family when he was quite young um, after they came over from Cuba. And that's where my mom is from. So my earliest memories of making music were very much uh, white Midwestern rural Catholic uh, expressions, kind of post Vatican II uh, musical expressions. I went on to study at Northwestern where I studied um, choral conducting classical music and ended up working in a range of communities first in Chicago and then ultimately in LA where I met Cecilia. I was at Loyola Marymount University as the director of music for the chapel there. And it was just before that, that I started getting published. I had started writing liturgical music, mainly out of need, kind of setting those Psalms that nobody really wants to set, um, you know, those antiphons, those acclamations that are, that are there in the books, but nobody yep. really feels particularly <laughs> inspired by. But like Cecilia, I um, realized I didn't really have the theological formation, even though I had the musical formation. And so while I was at LMU working, I also pursued a master's degree, um, which, you know, people like Cecilia and others started to hand me books like The Community of the Beautiful by Alejandro Garcia Rivera and Caminemos con Jesus by Roberto Goizueta and other things that, that started to make sense for me theologically of my experiences. You mentioned there, uh, Tony Roberto Goisueta, the this book, which, which has had a huge influence on you both, actually. Could you say something about, about its argument and why it's so influential and why we need to, to hear from it? My recent project, named after that book, responds to, I think, some of the implicit invitations Goisueta is uh, offering in that book. One is for US Latino, Latinas, Latinx folks to take seriously their lives, their experiences, their communities as a privileged site of the revelation of God. 
And he does this especially through attention to popular religious practices, devotions that often fall outside the grid of traditional ecclesiologies, uh, liturgical and sacramental theologies. So it's the first time that I saw represented in a scholarly writing some of these real material um, expressions that were meaningful to me, but rarely, rarely made the cut in many books. And then the other um, is he calls the church to an ongoing theology of accompaniment grounded in a preferential option for the poor and the powerless, very much rooted in his own study of liberation theology, looking backwards and looking forwards, very much anticipating the writings of Pope Francis and others. Um, so my work, it really, I see it very much responding to those two invitations. Uh, you know, the theology of accompaniment or accompaniment that uh, goes to it, that lays out, I think is, is one of the extraordinary contributions of this, uh, of this work that has formed, you know, now multiple generations of theologians. And, and it, it is the, this invitation to what is inherently an experience of being wounded. Uh, and, and in that he has a lot of commonality with Alejandro Gar Garcia Rivera's work, who was my dissertation director at the GTU and, and his concept of wounded innocence. Um, Goizueta wants to invite us to this uh, intentional walking with the wounded of the world, right. best right. represented obviously, and, and as, as Tony's beautiful song says, right? In walking with the cross of Jesus, walking next to Jesus, we are gifted, not we are we are not saviors, but we are actually being uh, led <laughs> into right. a yep. state of grace. Um, and so uh, it's 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 extraordinarily important. And it, for me, it it just completely works with my own theology of beauty yep. and has helped me to to move it forward. That's lovely. Um, when I uh, trained in theology originally in the seventies and eighties. The, the Latin American liberation theology, of course, was beginning to make a very big impact in, in European circles as well. What's different about what's come out since, since Gosueta and others in Latin America? Would you, could you highlight some, some, as it were, some new developments or some new emphases that weren't quite so strong in the first generation? Well, I mean, I think Tony already alluded to, to a major one, and that is the attention to the uh, religion of the people, to yeah, the popular yeah. religion, to the practices, uh, to the aesthetic expressions uh, that that's where they're doing theology. That's yeah. where theology and, and, and it's a profound theology. It, it's a, 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 an important theology that theologians ignore at their own peril. Um, because it is uh, there. It is just replete with uh, profound insights, uh, as Tony shows in his album uh, with uh, a piece that he retrieves uh, from, from our, our own tradition in, in Cuba. So I, I think that that has been one major change. I mm. think another change has been the attention and the, the, uh, our own eruption of women into the conversation yeah. and right. into highlighting uh, the the role of women in 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 this project and and also to to include them more intentionally um and so i think those two things would be a uh, major uh developments thank you Cecilia. tony anything you want to add to that no amen to all of that i think the other thing is i'm noticing uh greater attention to specificity um, a movement away from making broad generalizations about Latinx yep. people, attentive, right. attentiveness to specific communities. And then um, I think one of the most important questions that Latinx uh, theology is being asked is, is to be greater, um, more attentive to the Afro-Latino experience, which is not mm -hmm. received the same um, care uh, for a range of reasons um, as uh, Latino experience more broadly. Thank you. Let's get on to your to your album, um, and Cecilia has written a, a wonderful review of this 
I think this album, this is Camaremos con Jesus, Jesus rather, sorry, Let Us Walk with Jesus, which I've listened to with great pleasure. Uh, it gets a, a, a Latin Grammy nomination. It's described as groundbreaking, uh, drawing on your Cuban heritage. Tell us about this album and how it came about. So, as I said, my experience uh, of growing up Cuban American was very different than many uh, of my siblings uh, in Christ <laughs> growing up in Miami, where it's a very concentrated particular experience. And so music and food, but uh, I'll talk about music since this is about aesthetics, are, uh, and music and food were the two things that really connected me with my Cuban heritage when I was far from it physically. And so I've always had this kind of lingering dream of what it might mean to unite particular strands of Cuban music with my work as a composer of sacred music, accompanied by a deep fear of actually doing it. The music of my father's Cuban homeland has been the language of my heart for as long as I can remember. Caminemos con Jesus is my attempt to express my faith through the beauty and the passion of that music, especially a genre known as the son cubano. Son is the heartbeat of Cuban music. I didn't know that I had the authority to do it. I didn't know how it would work liturgically. A lot of reservations. I always say that I usually start a project with all the ways it can go wrong. So those are very much on my mind. But I would say two practical things really nudged me toward the project. One was the loss of my Cuban grandmother a few years ago, Daisy. Uh, when you start to lose the, the deepest anchors to parts of your heritage, I think you begin to, to look at their life and, and um, what they brought to your faith in new ways. And so I found myself cooking her recipes, reconstructing her home altar, and of course, wanting to reconnect more deeply with the music. And then the other was the first trip that my father and I took to Cuba, his first trip um, since he left in the middle of the night when he was six, and my first trip ever in 2017. And so those two kind of practical reasons really started to nudge me toward this project. Um, but then uh, the, the work of a lot of Latinx scholars also in both their written work, but also their own personal prodding um, to take these elements of my identity more seriously really pushed me toward it um, and to create a project that I don't think um, there's anything quite like it in terms of embracing a very specific style, the son cubano, a particular style of Cuban music that's the foundation of contemporary salsa music and all other kinds of music, mm -hmm. timba, mm -hmm. uh, and to think about what it might look like liturgically. And so that that really was what led to um, the, the beauty and the, the messiness of creating this incredible project with so many incredible colleagues. Uh, was both faithful to the the, the style, but also in our view, um, accessible to most. Very, that's very important, very yeah. important. Cecilia, what would you like to say about the album that Tony's too modest to say? It's fantastic. <laughs> Great. Uh, it will make you, you know, uh, uh, pray with your entire body, which I think is one of, of the great gifts that uh, Cuban music uh, brings from the African side of us, um, and uh, the uh, you know the the call and response that we see in the black spirituals. Well, that's going on uh, in in Cuban music all the time, um, and and it's it th there's no separation right between uh, you know your prayerful self and your embodied self. You've got a lovely phrase which kind of haunted me. Accompaniment means having our hearts repeatedly broken as we wipe their blood-stained faces. Yeah. And, so and there's real there's real poignant, I mean, what I picked out, yeah, there's real poignancy in here as well. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the first the first heartbreaking part of, of the project is that Tony and I are away from our island. Um, and that we we can't just you know, all be going back and forth and loving each other and, and rebuilding uh, our land. That's the first, for me, that's the first heartbreak. Um, yes. And, yes. and then uh, the, the retrieval of, of some of, of our music uh, that he does that again breaks your heart because you, you realize the richness of, of our tradition. And, and, and I, I'm, I, it's also very poignant that 
Tony being a, a second generation uh, Cubano um, has, has constituted this, this new expression for us that brings the island and, and us in the diaspora together. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think, invites the rest of the Latinx community into this experience. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles uh, and my family was in Miami for a very short time. And so I am so Mexican in many ways uh, that, uh, that I, I love to be taken into the Mexican culture and, 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 and Mexican uh, sacred spaces. So for me now to be able to invite people into Cuban culture and Cuban yeah. spaces is, is a hospitality as well. Uh, a slightly tough question. Well, is it tough? I don't know. Um, suppose someone said to you, well, this is very exciting uh, what you're doing for this very complex, rich culture. Um, uh, here I am in, I don't know, say a predominantly white suburb of Los Angeles. Uh, we've got our own music, thanks very much. Uh, we've got our own liturgical traditions, which we're very proud of and which we're going to celebrate. What could I, why do I need to learn from what you two have discovered? For me, I, I would counter with the question is why should I learn yours? Mm. Yours is just as contextual. Yours yep. is just as about you as ours is about us. So if we are going to live uh, as a community, and if we are going to really learn to love one another as God loves us, then why would you not want to get to know us just like we want to get to know you? You know, I want to learn as much as I possibly can from, you know, my, in Los Angeles, right? I, I am, you know, let me go to our black churches. Let me go to our Asian communities. Let me experience what it is to be home with you um, because that's how I get to know you. And let me sing with you and let me yeah, sing with you. And, and so I, I, you know, I absolutely think that uh, we need to move into this space where we, we celebrate intentionally the beauty of differences and, and how enriching those are. Thank you, Sarah, it's a terrific reply. And presumably at another level, because it has just big, imp a, it ought to have a big impact on the way we conceive what theology is and the theological tasks. What has the right. pandemic done, do you think, to your work and the way you conceive your work? Well, certainly practically when this came out in January and two months later, uh, it was, um, everything was closed down. It, it really limited the, the way in which we can do this music. And one of the things I love about this style of music and so many kinds of music that come from minority communities is that it can't be done without other people. <laughs> it is yeah. uh, literally en conjunto. We have to do it together. And so, uh, you know, like Adam had asked me earlier if I could play some of these. And I said, not really, <laughs> not really without people in the same room. Um, which is something beautiful. I think it testifies to Latinx theology more broadly. I think we have that commitment, right? In terms of the pandemic, I think it's laid bare many things for me. Um, aesthetically, it's it's laid bare certain gaps in our own repertoires as a church, um, certain words we lack to give voice to deep lament and sorrow in some of our traditions and especially in some musical styles more than others. And so we find ourselves turning to, to things that don't really express the deepness of the kind of woundedness as Cecilia was talking about earlier. So for me, it's, it's got me thinking a lot more about how to represent that woundedness in our artistic expressions uh, and also to be attentive to where it does exist and maybe we haven't paid enough attention to it. So I don't think the answer to this endless um, violence and anti-black, anti-Asian, anti-this and that hatred um, is less beauty. <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, 
so much of the most beautiful expressions I know emerge precisely out of those experiences. And um, I think one of the, the deep gaps in the Christian aesthetic repertoire broadly conceived, and I'll say especially musically, is um, music that gives voice to the woundedness of the world. I think we need to take every opportunity that we can during this time to, to grieve, to lament, to lay, let out righteous anger uh, at the things that have been laid bare in, in, our, in, our, uh, in the way we organize society. Uh, you know, I, I, Latinx theologians and Black theologians and Asian theologians have been writing about a lot of this for many, many years. And it's like now people have just discovered, oh, you mean that, you know, people are dying because they don't have access to healthcare? You mean that, you know, all of these things that, that we've been pointing to that have been marring the face of creation uh, are now out here, right? So I, I want people to look at them. I want to pay attention to them. Um, and I want our arts to break our hearts uh, by lifting up our lament and our grief. That's on the one side. On the other side, I find that people will and are paying attention to their bodies now because they can't use them. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I was meeting with like this last night with, a, with uh, a group of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, all in Spanish with our Latinx community. And uh, I, I said, let's try to remember how it smells to be in a room full of incense. Let's try to recall what the light looks like as it comes through mm -hmm. our stained glass windows. We've been in lockdown in the city mm -hmm. for a year. Uh, and so when we are able to go back to our worship spaces and when we're back able to sing together again, I think we will value it so much more. And I want us to, and I want us to intentionally talk about our bodies and about our differences and about the beauty of everything that surrounds us. And then for me, the, the big thing that I've been pursuing uh, lately is to notice when it's absent. Notice when it is absent. Aesthetic insight happens also in beauty's absence. Notice it, have it really hurt, and then have that move you ethically to change it, to bring beauty back. And so I, I think it's a very important moment in our, in our history as, a, as an entire planet. And I hope that we don't miss it. That's a, a terrific way to end conversation. So warm thank you to you both. I've, I've just loved uh, what you've been saying and, and the way you've been saying it as well, if I may say. Bye-bye.